We are in Psalm 7, uh, and I'd like to, you to turn there in your Bible. Uh, and I told you I wasn't going to do all the psalms, so I will skip around uh, here and there. Um, this is a, a lament psalm. It's a personal lament uh, of David pouring his heart out to God in a, in a very troublesome time. Uh, 30% of the psalms are personal laments. Uh, and they are, they are problematic, as we're going to see, because of the, how they're structured. Um, we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, we, we will not do all of them uh, be, because of, there's so many of them. And how many, how many times can I talk about a personal lament uh, in how many different perspectives? So we'll, we'll cover some of them. But this is a, this is a pivotal one, so we're going to look at it. Uh, I'm going to be on vacation uh, starting next uh, Friday for uh, two weeks to see my grandchildren. Uh, in Sacramento, and Pastor Michael will bring, be bringing the word uh, that God has laid on his heart. When I get back, uh, I'm going to do Psalm 8, if you would like to read ahead. So uh, a lot have been asking me, what are we reading or studying so they can read ahead? So with those things in mind, let's go to God in prayer and ask for his uh, anointing on the scriptures. Uh, Lord, we open the, the Psalms today. Uh, they are a, a song uh, sung to you in worship, and how sweet the music is to your ears. May it be a, a song that we learn from today. Uh, and, and may it teach us uh, how to live in troublesome times, uh, how to gain strength, how to find peace, and how to live a wise life uh, when we live among so many people that are unwise. And teach us from David's example in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to pose uh, a very pragmatic question today, and I've asked this uh, question of myself many times over the years as I've attempted to live a godly life. Uh, here is the question. How should a growing, maturing believer um, respond to vile, vicious attacks? And when I was younger, you know, I thought everybody was my friend. But then, then, uh, then I became a pastor. Uh, and I realized when you teach the truth of the Word of God in a godless culture, uh, you are not going to be everybody's favorite. And, uh, and, and it's tough. No matter if you're a Christian young person living on a college campus that's uh, secular, trying to live a godly life, it's not when you're going to get attacked verbally. It's, 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 it's when. What, what do you do when that happens? Well, how should a Christian respond? Well, it's easy to give the first blush answer that we know from our Lord's first sermon on how to deal as a kingdom person in the here and now with tough situations. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 44. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies, love them, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Four things we're supposed to do there. Uh, and this is counterculture. This is, this is against the grain of how you're, how you're wired. Jesus said to his people in his very first sermon on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, he said, hey, look, I want you to live in this fashion when people come against you and they oppose the faith and they oppose you as my child. This is how I want you to, you, to behave. Uh, is that the only way we are to respond? That's the question. I mean, we're always supposed to do that. Uh, what we're going to find uh, is that there's a tension in the Bible uh, that you find, even in the New Testament, if you pay attention, there's a tension between what Jesus says here and what happens when he deals with extremely wicked, vile people. Uh, case in point, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, uh, Jesus brings the woes against the Pharisees, those religious people who should have known that Jesus was the Messiah, should have worshiped him, but they dogged him and persecuted him and badgered him his entire ministry until they finally got him on a cross. Uh, they went after him constantly. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus levels seven woes against them. Seven. You can count them. So from, Deuter uh, from uh, Matthew 23 verse 13, uh, the first woe, to Matthew 23 verse 29, Jesus gives them seven distinct woes. I'm talking W-O-E, like it's too bad for you, you're gonna be judged. He gives them no quarter. And when Jesus does that, you see that uh, what he said in Matthew 5 and what he did in life, there was a tension between those two things. There's a tension, there's always a tension. As you live through your life, you'll understand that there's always that tension. Uh, that tension was seen in the life of Jeremiah, and I will eventually get to Psalm chapter 7, but I've got to, got to build the case for what we're going to encounter here so you understand what, what David's getting at. In a, Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he was commissioned by God from the womb in chapter 1. God called him from the womb of his mother to be the prophet to Israel to give him a message of doom that they were going to be judged, and it was a message no one was going to want to hear. Imagine that job description. 
Uh, he was opposed all through his ministry as he tried to call his people back from sin, and they did everything they could to stop him, to silence him. In Jeremiah chapter 11, notice his approach to those who opposed him as the prophet of God. Verse 18, it says, Now the Lord gave me knowledge of it, that they were going to try to do him in, uh, and, I, and I know it. Uh, for you, God, showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. I was innocent. Uh, and, and he said, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, what did they want to do? Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. So when a nation is heading off the cliff to judgment, what happens? Well, they start attacking people who speak for the truth of God. They don't want to hear the word of God. So they want to get rid of Jeremiah, who's a, a thorn in their side. They want to eliminate him. Verse 20 says, but O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your what? Vengeance. Let me see your vengeance on them. Uh, not Jeremiah's vengeance, the vengeance of God. It says, for to you I have revealed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Ananoth, who seek your life, saying, quote, this is what they were telling Jeremiah, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Translated, we don't want to hear any more of what you want to say for God. We're tired of hearing truth. We love our error. Therefore, verse 22 says, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young man will die by the sword, the sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and there shall be a, no remnant for them, for I will bring catastrophe on the men of uh, Anathoth, uh, even the year of their punishment. God says, I am going to bring judgment, and Jeremiah, you're going to see vengeance. Notice the tension. What did Jesus say? If your enemy uh, uh, is attacking you, well, what did Jesus say? Uh, love them, bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. But then later, Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says, but woe to you for opposing the Messiah, that tension. When you see Jeremiah, Jesus was merely being like Jeremiah, because Jeremiah here is saying, God, they're trying to eliminate me, your prophet. Uh, may I live to see the day that you ex ex exact your judgment upon them, your vengeance. Not my vengeance, but yours. But later in the book of Jeremiah, uh, you see that after they've thrown Jeremiah into a cistern, and a cistern was a... a, a like uh, carved into the stone, into the ground, into the limestone, a giant uh, reservoir for holding water as it would drain through the town, would drain into the cistern. Uh, no one would want to be thrown in one of those because it was dark, it was dank, it was dirty, uh, filthy water was in there. Uh, they, they, they throw the prophet Jeremiah in there under the, the, the blessings of King Zedekiah. But then King Zedekiah comes to uh, Jeremiah prophetly, uh, privately. Uh, and in Jeremiah 38 verses 20 to 23, he, he, he needs to have a word with the prophet because his conscience is bothering him. He basically wants to know, I'm gonna, am I going to live or am I going to die when the Babylonians come? And Jeremiah, who had prayed for vengeance then turns and lovingly tells the king who had him thrown into the cistern, well, your, your company, country's gonna get attacked, but, but you're gonna live. You're gonna, you're gonna suffer, but, but you're, gonna, you're going to make it. He spoke the truth to him. See the tension? There's tension, there's always that tension. I, I sometimes think we've, 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 we forget there's tension. But this is what we see in the, in the Psalter is that tension. Because in, the, in Psalm chapter seven, we, we see a pivotal life question about how to diff, deal with really mean-spirited evil people. Uh, Psalm seven, one through 17 is, is the question posed in such a fashion. It says, how should I respond to verbal volleys lo lobbed against me and they're designed to vaporize your voice. They're, they're designed to shut you down. See, this is the culture. Like they tried to shut down Jeremiah they will try to shut you down and they'll do all kinds of mean-spirited things to, uh, to accomplish that goal. How should you as a Christian respond? Well, Psalm 7 gives you the information on how you should respond. Uh, when you look at Psalm chapter 7 uh, in your English Bible, you will notice uh, that there is what is called a superscription uh, in really small words right before verse 1. Uh, and, it, and it says, this is a Shagayon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Now, you might think, but it would be erroneous thinking, that that is just added by uh, the people that put the, the Bible together, and that's not part of the scripture. You would be wrong, because that is part of scripture. In fact, in Hebrew, that's verse one. 
which means that's the inspired word of God. And so what we have here is we have an account that David says, I wrote this song to God when I was being attacked by a man named Cush from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Saul, King Saul was a Benjamite, which means if Cush was a Benjamite and Saul was a Benjamite, they, they had a lot of political ideology in mind that even though the kingdom had been given to David, Cush is, uh, is of one mind with, with Saul to get rid of young David. So he's a problem for David. Exactly when this occurred, scholars don't know, but it probably took place in 1 Samuel 22, chapter 24 and chapter 26, as King Saul and his men hunted David to kill him, to silence him. How did David respond in that situation? Uh, well, when you see David's responses and you study the, the Samuel and how uh, David uh, dealt with uh, Saul trying to kill him, uh, even though he was the chosen king of, of Israel to replace King Saul, David had that tension. So at En Gedi, uh, when, when David is in a cave, and I just was there two months ago with my tour group, in that cave with the waterfall feeding into the cave, it's very loud inside the cave. When King Saul comes in there to go to the bathroom, that's what he was doing. Uh, at that moment, he didn't know that David and his warriors were in the cave. And we all know the story that David could have just walked over and killed Saul and then become the king. But he didn't. He showed grace. He showed mercy to that man who had hunted him and who, who had men like Cush uh, coming after him and, and doing all kinds of verbal, mean, vile things to David. He could have taken him out, but he, but he didn't. So there's, on the one hand, you see David showing grace to King Saul uh, and those people that worked with him. And on the other hand, when you get to Psalm 7, you see David kind of reached his limit with one of those man, Cush, and he pours out his soul to God, asking for God to judge this man. Basically, I'm, God, may I live to see your vengeance on Cush. You know, if you're honest with your life, and if you're old enough to look around at your life, uh, you all have had a cushion in your life. I have. I remember all of their names. It's that, <laughs> of course, nobody in our church. Uh, but it's that person who has just dogged you. They're mean, they're ruthless, they're vile, they, they're gossipy, they spread disinformation. See, that, that's cush. That's cush. Uh, Psalm 7 teaches us how to deal with that kind of person. Uh, and if you don't believe that this kind of behavior occurs in the New Testament, all you have to do is turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, which tells us that those saints that are killed in the tribulation by the Antichrist, it says in Revelation 6, 10, that they are before the throne of God, asking God night and day for seven straight years that they would live to see the vengeance of God Almighty bring justice to the earth. Which tells you, well, they're... Isn't anything wrong with praying for God to bring justice? Just have that tension between blessing and loving and, and, and being compassionate toward them. But in the vileness, there may come the point where you have to pray for God's justice to be seen. And so that's what we have here. Dr. Walt Kaiser, an Old Testament scholar of the First Order, says this about Psalm 7. He's completely right about his analysis. He says, God has, God has placed personal and national laments in Scripture, it would appear as a corrective against euphoric, celebratory notions of faith, which romantically portray life as consisting only of sweetness and light. Who would ever think that? You know, you just come to Jesus and everything's just gonna fall in place. Uh, well, not so. You know, when you, when, you, when you trade kingdoms and leave the devil's kingdom behind and embrace the kingdom of Christ, I mean, then the devil's not gonna be happy. So he's gonna come after you with people like Cush. He goes on to say, such a one-sided happiness only view uh, fails to deal with the realities of life. He said that it drives the hurtful and painful side of life into the corners of faith and practice, leaving few guides or comforts from mortals or the word of God. And then here's the key. He says, on the contrary, God has given us the laments of scripture like Psalm 7 as a solace where the full spectrum of our earthly journey can be represented. Yeah, what do I do when someone is cushioning my life? and is perpetually evil over, over, and over again. Well, we learn from David how to deal with them. Uh, we wanna look at uh, David's response. How should you respond? Well, number one, you, in this situation, when you run into Cush, and you, if you work at the Pentagon, or if you're at the White House, or wherever you are, you probably already have in your mind right now the name of this person. You're probably already telling your wife, your husband, your kids, it's not Cush, it's Larry. 
you know, or Steve, etc. Just don't, don't call me and give me the name. That's, you know, between you and God. What should you do? Well, number one, you should appeal to God, verses one to two. Notice, he says, this is a meditation of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. So what should you not do? Well, he says appeal to God. So what should you not do? You should, you should not run to an attorney. I, I, I can't believe what Cush has done to me again. I am getting this guy. I'm taking him for everything he's got. No, you don't run to an attorney. You do not run to friends. That, trust me, I've been in these situations when you're attacked by Cush. You run to friends, and you get all the friends you know are going to identify with you to support you, to help you stand against the, the claims against Cush. You might eventually go there, but don't go there first. What, what did David say? You don't run to any of those situations first. You run to God. You run to God first. You run to God first. See, he learned all this on the anvil of adversity. Uh, he calls this a meditation in the Hebrew, uh, and it's also stated in the New American Standard in the New in the International Version. It calls this as a, it calls this a shagayon of David. What in the world is that? Uh, well, a shagayon is a is a musical number. So it's like if you're playing the piano, uh, and it says Adante. If it says forte, if it says pianissimo, I mean, you know if it says pianissimo, I'm playing softly. If it says forte, I'm pounding the keys, etc. If it's crescendo, I'm building to that point to a crescendo. See, this is what this, this term means. It's a, it denotes a passionate song, passionate. That's gonna have peaks and valleys just like life. So we don't have the music to this song anymore, but David said, when I was attacked by Cush, I devised the song to God. That's mind boggling. When's the last time you were attacked by Cush and you thought to yourself, you know what, honey? I think the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a song about Cush. Right, right. Uh, Chopin's Funeral March. I love Chopin, I've said it many times. I love to play Chopin's pieces, they're beautiful. A lot of them were written, the etudes were written to, of Chopin to his, 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 the girl he loved, and you can just see the emotion of his love wrapped up in those etudes, and the nocturnes, they're wonderful. But anyway. Uh, Chopin's Funeral March, I've played it many times. It's, it is like a funeral dirge. It's very depressing, it's very deep. It's down at the base end of the keyboard and it's just like, wow, this is depressing. Could you play something else? But then all of a sudden, in the middle of that song is the most beautiful haunting melody, a point of great life in the middle of that song and you're like, wow, I'm glad I played all these other measures because this is wonderful. But it doesn't last long, because then it gets back to the, <laughs> the funeral part. And when, when the first time I played that, I thought, you know, that's kind of like life. It has those deep, dark moments, and then there's that moment of, ah. And then it's tough again, but then there's another moment of, ah. See, that's, that's a shagayon of David. David said, this is my life as I've dealt with Cush. How did he deal with Cush? Well, he, he ran to God first. It says uh, here specifically that he ran to the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. He, he, he ran to the Lord first. Who's, who's the Lord? Uh, that's the Yahweh, the covenant God, the eternal God. What's that mean? Why do you pick that term? Because well, that, that God's always gonna be there for you. You know, now let's go back to you devising a song the next time you run into Cush. You might think, well, I can't fill the scripture because I can't write songs. And if I can write songs, they're not usually really good ones. Okay, well, if you can't write a song or write really good songs to God, borrow one. Plagiarize. Uh, Martin Luther, a mighty fortress is our God. Make that your song. What are the words? I love this verse. And though this world with devils, Cush, devils of field should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we will tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. If you can't sing, you can't write a song, then grab Martin Luther's song and say, God, is it okay I, if I just take this song? I'll, I'll give the credits to him in my life, but I'm, I'm taking this song. You know, I mean, there are so many times in my life that I've been off by myself facing difficulties and God puts a song on my mind and I'm just singing it to myself. You know, out working in the yard, just singing to myself. Uh, and, and make that your song. And so run to God with your song. Uh, what, it, what were the components of his song? He says, oh, oh Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Notice the two words. He, he says L-O-R-D, capitalized, meaning Yahweh, the eternal God, the covenant God, and God, 
capital G, small O-D. That means Elohim. That's the first name of God in the Old Testament, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Why does he use these two words when God has so many other names? He wants to emphasize that God is a covenantal God who will always be there for him, and he's, a, he's the creator God. So if he created everything ex nihilo by the word of his mouth, he can totally take care of you because he has unlimited power and he will never desert you. That's why he says this. He says, oh Lord, let me tell you why I put my trust in you and not in my attorney. No, I, I put my trust in you because of who you are. God is there for you. Never forget as the devil whispers in your ear that Cush is gonna destroy your life. Never forget that God is always gonna be there for you. He's always Yahweh, the covenantal God, and he backs up his covenantal promises to be there with you with his extreme power as the creator. So I would say if God can make everything that exists by the word of his mouth in six days, he can handle the Cush in your life, whatever his name is. What did, he, what did he pray to God when he appealed to God? He says a very, what you would pray, or what you've probably prayed before, save me, <laughs> no kidding, Lord, save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none delivered. Lord, he said, I'm, I'm thinking of a metaphor, and Cush is like a lion. I mean, have you ever been to the zoo and seen a lion? I mean, this is a picture of a lion. Not, I'm glad I didn't take this. I don't know if the photographer lived. Does that lion look happy? No, he looks hungry. You know, and he says, you know, Lord, I've seen lions before, David says, and I've fought them before. And he says, you know, they, they are, they're mean, they're ruthless, they're hungry, they're powerful. You know, they're, they're hard to deal with. And he says, this is like Cush. He, he's just ready to pounce on my life every chance I get. He makes my life miserable. So he says, God, but this guy never wastes an opportunity to trash my life. So God, I have a request. He says, would you, would you save me? Would you save me? Remember, he's not going to other people. He's saying, God, I need you to save me. I need you to deliver me. Evan Williams, uh, the founder of Twitter, uh, had a podcast back in 2017. And this is what he said. He said, the internet is broken. Why? He says, because he devised it because he thought, because I read his article of his podcast, he thought that with Twitter, everybody would start communicating with each other and love each other and, and it would advance humanity and it would be wonderful. What's happened? Everybody is talking all right, negatively about anybody and everybody. He said it's broken, why? Because there's so much negativity on Twitter. Rabbi Joseph, a Tolushkin, uh, author of Words That Hurt, Words That Heal, uh, writes about how we are basically as a nation addicted, addicted to what he calls negative words. You know, isn't that the truth, especially in the DC environment? Wouldn't you like one day, I know it would be miraculous, one day where neither political party said anything mean about the other side? Could that happen? Well, I would pray that it could. I think it could, but it'd be a miraculous. But just imagine if they actually said nice things about each other, but, but they cannot. They cannot because there's too many men and women in the culture named Cush. And David says, God, they're, they're like a lion. They're like a lion. You know, if a lion is coming after you, uh, what should you do? Well, uh, well, if it's Cush, you should run to God run to God, and he will deliver you. I, I really like the word here for deliver. Uh, it's nasal in Hebrew. Nasal means to extricate somebody from an impossible situation. Extricate. Uh, in our culture, that makes you think of a fireman. You see a wreck, it's mangled, the person's stuck in there, they can't get out. There's no way they can get out. What do they bring to the crash site? Jaws of what? Life. Those things can open anything, even your wife's cans in the kitchen. Pops them right open. Jaws of life. What do they, they extricate you. He says, in this situation, God, I need extrication from Cush. I can't do it myself. Even though I'm powerful with the military, I, I can't do it. It's beyond me. Could you, could you extricate me? What do you do with a person who wants to vaporize you verbally? Number one, appeal to God first. Which leads to a simple question. Who are you appealing to? Who are you talking to? Because I know how we function. When we're attacked by Cush, we usually complain. We gripe. 
etc. We attack Cush verbally, amass information to, you know, decimate them, etc. No, go to God first. Number two, verses three to five, address your actions. This is kind of a, this is that portion of scripture that makes you kind of uncomfortable. It's like, why did God put this in here? Well, to teach us. Notice what he says, address your actions. Notice what David says. O Lord, my God, O Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God, God, the creator, same two words. Notice the conditional clauses. If I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to, to him who was at peace with me or have plundered my enemy without cause, then notice the cause effect. Then let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust, uh, Selah. If, that's the end of it, he says. If I am guilty of any of these things, this is amazing. David says, what, what, what should you do when Cush is coming after you? You should pause and be man or woman enough to say, God, have I done anything I shouldn't have done? Am I guilty? I mean, have I said anything I shouldn't have said? Used words I shouldn't have done? I, did I have conversations that cast that person in the wrong light? I mean, am I guilty of anything? You know, for those people that, uh, I don't even know what the word would be, uh, are frustrated with the fact that God sometimes doesn't answer your prayers quickly enough, here's one he'll answer quickly. <laughs> okay? It's like if you want to get patient and you ask God for patience, what happens within the next five minutes? A situation arises, so God says, well, there you go. So if you want to hear from God instantly, here's the prayer. You're facing Cush, wherever he is, Pentagon, White House, wherever you are, and you're dealing with him, and, and, and you're running to God. God's looking down going, hey, but what about you? Are, are you guilty in any way? So here's the prayer. God, here I am. Show me in my dealings with Cush, have I done anything that a Christian should not do? You show me, and I tell you what, the Holy Spirit will show you straight away, straight away. Because God knows your external actions and he knows your internal actions and he will show you. And then if you have done anything wrong to Cush, what should you do? You go to Cush and you say, hey, you know, I have been wrong. It's called confession. Could you imagine if that happened around DC? If the Cush types actually had people come to them saying, we have so responded inappropriately to you, we are coming to apologize. Imagine the, draw, the jaws on the floor. You're doing what? You're saying you're sorry? You're confessing? See, the Cush type, um, he needs to hear from you if you have done anything wrong, but you start with yourself first. You don't attack Cush, you, you attack your own life. God, show me my, my sin. Show me my sin. From these three verses, you can get a sense of what Cush was saying about David. He was saying three things about David. Number one, this is Cush speaking. Uh, I don't know what his voice sounded like, so I'll just use my voice. Uh, what, what, what did he say about David? He said, number one, uh, he's a hypocrite, for there's iniquity in, on his hands. I mean, he's, he's saying that I'm sinful, ah, he's as sinful as me. Number two, he's telling uh, David that day, and other people that David did him dirty when he was just innocent and minding his own business. And the third claim was, he stole uh, from me, is what he's saying. He stole from me when he should not have stole from me. Three claims. David looks at all three claims and he asks himself, have I done number one? No. Have I done number two? Mm, no. Have I stolen anything from him? No. And so David says, you know, before God, then I'm, I'm innocent. I'm innocent of those charges. You need to do the same thing. Lord, am I guilty of the claims? Because if you're guilty of the claims, you gotta go settle the situation to bring peace to the situation. Cush types, I've had my share of them uh, in life. Uh, when I planted my last church and I was there uh, for 19 years, uh, it's hard to plant a church. I mean, to start with just a handful of people, try to hold it together, you're in a school, you, you tend to draw people from larger churches that can't get into the power structures because it's too hard because the churches are too big. So they come to the church plant, uh, these people with tons of baggage and issues, and you're trying to attract people and you get all these problematic people. Trust me, I know all, all how that works. Not all the people are that way, but you get your fair share of difficult people. Uh, and uh, I told you before, and I, it's worth repeating. I know I'm telling you again, but I, I need to tell you again because it's so important. I used to keep track of the names those kind of people called me. I stopped at 19 names, mean names. He's not loving, he's not kind, he's not this, he's not that. I stopped at 19 names. I thought, this is ridiculous. I, I can't defend myself from Cush. 
I can't, I can't do it. So it's like a part-time job. And so you appeal to God and you ask yourself, I, I learned straight away as a young pastor, when Cush and I, uh, comes against you with information, you have to ask yourself, is their criticism true? Is there truth to their criticism? Because if there's truth, then you must respond to that in a godly way. And if not, then you are free. I had a Cush type come to me one time after a Sunday school class that I taught. And I like to joke around. It's, it's hard to joke around uh, when you're preaching in an empty sanctuary and there's no one there to laugh. So um, the staff has actually talked about getting a laugh meter if something was funny. So this whole COVID thing has been tough. But um, <laughs> I had a Cush type uh, at my last church. Uh, it, was in a, it, it was always just on me all the time. And he was sitting in a Sunday school class I was teaching, and there was a big time businessman sitting there that would always make wisecracks during class, and everybody would laugh, and he, he would usually direct the jokes at me. I was the brunt of his jokes, and I can take it. But you know how it goes. If you can dish it out, what? <laughs> you should be able to take it. So, you know, this went on for months, and I'm, this big businessman's always, you know, making me look funny, bad, etc. So one day in class, he said something, and I thought, you know, I, I've just got to take that and just bounce off of that, you know, back at him. And so I did. And he got really quiet. And the class was cracking up because what I said was funny. And there was no laugh meter. There were actually parishioners in the church. Um, and um, so after the Sunday school class was over, I was thinking everything went well. And I went into my office. Uh, and this cush type guy, well, let's call him Larry, uh, he walks behind me into my office and he's, uh, he's like, hey, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm thinking, oh no, it's cush. And he said, uh, hey, did you realize that what you just did in that Sunday school class completely decimated that businessman? I'm like, are you kidding me? I, and, and I looked at this guy and I said, are, he can dish it out and he can't take it? He said, uh, no, he, he really can't. He's really fragile. He's fragile? And so we had a little come to Jesus moment in my office and I was the one who had to come to Jesus because it's like, was I guilty? Mm-hmm, yeah, I decimated that guy. So church was about to start and I had some options. I could not go to church that day. Uh, I, could, uh, I could go out before church and find the guy and tell him, uh, you know, hey, uh, do we need to talk? Uh, I could just totally not even address it at all. I decided, you know what, I, I need to go out there and make it right. So I did. I approached the guy and I said, uh, hey, uh, this guy who was the Cush type individual I could have totally blown off, who wants to listen to Cush? But I did. He, he told me that, uh, that you were offended. Did what I say offend you? This big guy's like, yeah. And I could have said, you mean you can dish it out and you can't? I mean, you know what I mean? Your carnality steps in. I didn't do it. I thought about it. I didn't do it. But I said, you know, did I, did I, did I hurt your feelings? He said, yes, you did. And I said, well, you know what? Before church starts, I just want to tell you, that was not my intention. I will never do that again in a class with you. I apologize all over myself. Got it right. And so that's the godly thing to do. I would not say it's always the easy thing to do. But David says, I need to address my actions. See, I tend to think that sometimes we're so involved with Cush, we forget to think about ourselves and our heart. Have I done anything? Ask God. Number three, ask for justice. Ask for justice. Verses six to 10. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift, up, uh, lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up to me in judgment. Uh, that you have commanded. So the congregation of the peoples shall surround you for their sakes, therefore return on high. He's praying for justice. He, he says, oh Lord, remember L-O-R-D is Yahweh, the covenant God. He said, God, he's attacking your anointed king, me. I know you're angry. Why? Because he's attacking an innocent man. See, God's always, his holiness moves him to divine anger toward those who attack innocent people. He says, God, it's about time that, that your anger moved you to some kind of justice with this man. I mean, vindicate me. This is what he's asking for in verses six to seven. He's saying, God, let there be a congregation of witnesses like in a courtroom that will come and you arrive and I'll step forward and Cush will step forward. You'll present the evidence that you know and then judge that guy because of what he's done to me. Verse eight. He says in verse eight, this is exactly what he asked for, his judgment. He says, the Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For, righteous, the, for the righteous God tests the hearts and the minds. Notice the present tense. He tests them constantly. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. If you're innocent of said charges before God Almighty, 
Your integrity is sound. You haven't done anything to Cush. He's just an evil, vile person attacking you as a Christian. I'm going to put to you that there is nothing wrong with asking God to, be, to show himself uh, powerful in your situation to bring justice to the situation. Because it says God tests the hearts and the minds. He constantly tests hearts and minds. To wants, he wants to know of all people, righteous behavior, unrighteous behavior. Psalm 37 verse 12 says, the wicked plots against the just. Boy, do they. They gnash at him with their teeth. The Lord laughs at him for he sees his day is coming. What day? Well, the day of the judgment of God. See, Cush has forgotten about the coming of the judgment of God. But here we see David says, Lord, I pray that I might live to see you uh, deal with Cush one-on-one. -on -one. I, I want to see justice. There's nothing wrong with praying for the justice of God in your situation. Years ago, uh, another Cush-inspired man uh, wreaked havoc on me as a pastor. Uh, didn't like my preaching because he said my preaching bothered his wife. <laughs> And the reason why it bothered his wife was the things we were talking about in the scriptures were her sin. I found that out later. But of course, the Spirit of God is convicting her. So what did he do? Instead of telling his wife, you need to confess the sin that the scriptures are talking about, he attacks me like they attack Jeremiah. And he wants me to change my message. When I didn't change the message and I just continued to teach you the word of God, he continued to attack me. And he made my life miserable. He was a very uh, powerful man. Um, he took all my sermons and he transcribed them. He had his secretary, his executive secretary, transcribed my sermons so he could analyze them to then tear me apart. That's exactly what he did on a weekly basis. It was exciting. Um, and uh, I dealt with this guy for several years. Uh, and one day I received a phone call from his executive secretary. And this is what she told me. I don't even know the lady. She calls me and she tells me who she is. I'm like, you're who? And well, you know, so-and-so's secretary. Oh, uh, that big firm. Mm -hmm, yeah. I said, what can I do for you? This is what she told me. She said, you know, I don't know if you know this, but she said, uh, my boss, this guy, has me transcribe all of your sermons on Monday morning. She goes, I just want to let you know I don't go to church. <laughs> and he's assigned me to do this. And she said, I don't know what he's doing with them. I didn't tell her he was using them to, you know, attack me. But... Um, she said, I don't know what he's doing with them, but I, she said, I just wanted to call and tell you, just as a person out in the community, that I have learned more about God and learned more about myself, and I've grown spiritually by, by transcribing these sermons. I just wanted to call and say thank you. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. See, I tell you the story to tell you. Sometimes God lets you see justice. When I hung up the phone, I thought, is not God amazing? After years of dealing with Cush, and God says, hey, Marty, let me answer your prayer and let you see a little justice that God has used this messed up situation to impact an executive secretary for eternity. And then it's worth it. It's worth it. What else should you do? Verses 11 to 16, you should alert the deceived. Who are the deceived? Cush is the deceived. You should alert them to what? Well, verse 11 tells you, God is a just judge. And God is what? Angry. With who? The wicked. When? Every day. See, he's holy. See, Cush forgets that God is holy. All the people in our culture named Cush, who go after godly people and make people's lives miserable, they, in their pride and their arrogance and their struggle for power, they forgetting there's a living God who's completely just, and they will stand before him one day and give account. See, God is a just judge. He cannot be bought off. Uh, he, can't, he does not care who you are. He does not care uh, what you have accomplished, how many letters are after your name, where you went to school, how much power you have, how many men are under your command. He cares about none of that. He only cares about justice. And he has all the facts. And because he's holy, when he sees innocent people being taken advantage of by Cush, he says, you know, one day I'm going to move against you. And you're going to stand before me and give account for how you behaved. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm glad my life's covered by the blood of Christ. Because when I stand before him uh, and, and, and he looks at my life, well, my life's covered by the blood of Christ. I mean, I, I can stand there as a son. And he can evaluate my, my walk and reward accordingly. But I don't have to worry about the judgment of God falling on me. 
But see, Cush, he's not under the blood of Christ, that type of person, uh, typically. Uh, and he's going to be standing there before God Almighty without the blood of Christ. And, and, and God is going to look at his behavior and judge him based on how he treated other people. I mean, the fire of the eternal unmentionable place will be related to what he did in this life. He forgets this. See, this is what David says in this, God, you're a just judge and you're angry with the wicked every day. Uh, I, I know you're gonna come in judgment. What's he saying? I need to remind Cush of the fact that you are the living God. Verse 12, notice what he says. If he does not turn back, that's the word for repentance, he, God, will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and he makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble. Boy, does he. He brings forth falsehoods, uh, fake news all over the place to destroy godly people. But notice, he says, but he made a pit and he dug it out. He has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall become down on his own crown. It's kind of like uh, Lex Talionis which means hey, what goes around comes around. See, you might get away with being cush for years and years and years and trashing people on your way up the power structure, and God says, you know what? The way I designed the cosmos is when you break that moral fabric and you break it long enough, eventually the pit that you dug for other people to fall into, we totally nailed them with that story. You're gonna fall in that pit one day. The violence that you, that you put together against a person, verbally or physical, he says that's gonna be directed against you. You're gonna to have to deal with it. It's totally ironic. It's the way God dealt with the world so that there can be justice. See, God is not mocked by Cush ever. Never has he been, never ever will he be because God knows that which you reap is that which you shall sow. So what should you do if you're David um, other than running to God and all the other things that we mentioned? Well, if you have Cush in your life, you must love them enough to tell them, you know what, the way that you're living I know, and I don't think you know, but you need to know, there's a living God you're gonna have to stand before one day. Are you ready to stand before him? Because the way that you're living is it's not leading to optimal life. And I know you're not happy because a happy life is a life that knows the living God. Can I introduce him to you? See, he's warning him. He's warning him. Do you love Cush enough to warn him of what is coming? And then lastly, verse 17 kind of puts it all in perspective. David says here, you need to stop and ascribe praise to God in your tough situation. Don't complain, don't gripe, praise God. Notice what he says in verse 17. In this situation, he's, what does he say? Notice his vow. I will praise the Lord, this covenantal God, according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. He says, God, in the deal, dealings with Cush, and as evil as he is, as troublesome as he is, all the sleepless nights that I've had, God, I'm gonna do one thing. I'm gonna make a vow to you. That in this situation, I'm gonna make a vow that, I, that I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you, and I'm gonna sing praises to your great name because you are the most high God. There's no God greater than you. You know, if you make that vow to God, that even in your troublesome situation, wherever it is, that you will praise him in that situation, God will look down from heaven and he'll smile, and then he'll bless you greatly because you become a wise person to understand how to deal with tragedy. And that, that turning will give you great strength for the future. Uh, I've had cushion in my life many times. It shapes you. Uh, it, it hurts, but they shape you as you respond, as David did, to the Spirit of God, and it makes you a greater saint. I will pray for you to that end, that God will shape you as you deal with your own troublesome individual, that he'll bless you greatly. Let's pray. God, we thank you. This is for David, a, a man, a, a military man, a, a, a warrior of the first order, uh, who led men in battle and was victorious in all kinds of uh, situations involving warfare. But he, he was supple enough to sing, to play a harp, to, to put his heart to music. What a, what a un wonderful individual. Uh, no wonder he was a man after your heart. Uh, might we have the supple nature of David's heart to be honest and real and open before you. Put a song in our heart when we're dealing with Cush. May we make a vow of praise to you. And may we live to see you move that cush to the throne of grace where they can come to know you as Savior. And we pray that our prayers might be balanced between the tension that we've looked at today so that our lives can be even-keeled as we grow up in the faith. In Jesus' name, amen.